Thank you for joining us here tonight at the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. It's with great pleasure and enthusiasm that we welcome you to this small virtual assembly. Uh, we are totally indebted with you for you spending the time that you're spending uh, in joining us here in our midweek Bible study. But most of all, uh, I know that heaven is rejoicing and that God is proud of us as we take this time and sacrifice in order to uh, study another portion of God's word. Um, as always, I do want to extend some invitations to you and let you know that we always meet here on Wednesday night and you have an open invitation uh, to join us each week right here on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Central Time. But even greater, we want to see you in person and give you that warm Henry Street love and hospitality that you experience only at the Henry Street Church of Christ. And I'm talking about meeting with us in person on Sunday mornings as our worship service starts at 10 a.m. Central Time. So we would love to have you in the midst of us in our assembly. We meet at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gadsden, Alabama, USA. 35901 is our uh, area code, excuse me, zip code. And you can reach us easily at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. But just some quick administrative things here to uh, hopefully brighten your day and make you aware of resources if you are, aren't already um, equipped with these. Um, as you know, the Bible is the word of God that is, is the sword of the spirit. And we have many ways to sharpen your sword. Uh, what I mean by that is that we do have a YouTube channel in uh, conjunction with uh, this Facebook Live broadcast as well. Uh, of course, uh, you can go to YouTube.com and just type in my name, Anthony O. Norwood, or the Henry Street Church of Christ, and you'll be able to find our YouTube channel. And of course, you got the right one. If you come to the page that says Jesus is Lord on it with the header that says Bible study series and my picture with the black uh, suit and the red tie, you've come to the right place. And of course, as you know, if you're familiar and savvy with uh, YouTube, you'll find out that when you first come to a channel, the home page is there and you'll have the um, last five videos that were posted unto it. And of course, you'll have that big red uh, subscribe button that we want you to use. That is subscribe to our channel. And when doing so, and you log into your YouTube account, you'll find uh, or get that is the notifications that we post a new video. So that means you'll get a, a new posting every day if the good Lord sees fit because we do have a daily ministry here. Um, of course, we're going to tape that is record tonight's lesson. And we'll post it on YouTube within 24 hours. But we also do that for our worship services on Sunday. And we do that with what's called our daily devotional, uh, which we call One Minute Inspirations, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but again, we do ask you to subscribe to our channel, like and share the videos. And that's not just for uh, just trying to make things popular. But what happens is when you, you subscribe and you also uh, like and share videos, it makes them much more popular on uh, YouTube because YouTube is what we call the algorithm. You know, I, I work, uh, worked in computers for about 13 years and the algorithm is basically a computer program behind the scenes and that um, the way you got these things programmed, I can tell is that uh, the more likes and shares and subscribers you have, the more popular your channel will be on YouTube, no matter what. So when people type in Bible study, for instance, uh, the ones that come up in the study at the top of the list are those that have the most subscribers and uh, most likes and shares, etc. So we ask the household of faith to do that with our channel. Again, not for vainglory's sake, but so that we can get the truth out there. I don't know if you know this by now, but everybody out there that claim to be from God, not from God. And everybody that claims to be from God are not telling the truth. And unfortunately, uh, when it comes to popular channels and things like uh, YouTube, uh, the more you lie, the more popular you are. So we need a household of faith to rally around uh, things like this. And then, like I said, become subscribers and like and share the video so that we can make the truth overpower all the lies that are out there uh, in the world. But moving on, I want to um, 
put too much time into this uh, introductory stuff, but um, again, YouTube is organized in a certain way where we try to make it um, as easy for you to use as possible. Uh, do they do have a feature called Playlist, and you can go to the Playlist right on our site. And that's nothing but categories, uh, just a fancy way of saying it. And we got a lot of things broken down so that you can look and find things that are to your interest and do it quickly. Um, as you can see, I do have one of the arrows on the screen pointed to the one minute inspirations. That's the daily devotion I was talking about. Uh, that's usually within one to three minutes um, every day in order to get a quick dose of God's word uh, to encourage us, to inspire us, to motivate us and strengthen us in a day. I try to have that in the morning as soon as possible. Because obviously, the moment you wake up, Satan's going to uh, confront you. We might as well confront him with the sword of the spirit, being the word of God. And a quick way of doing that is the one minute inspiration. It'll be a different topic each uh, day for our daily devotional unto God. Of course, I do have another arrow on your screen that's uh, pointing to Romans. That is, that's how we study on Wednesday nights. We go through a book of the Bible. And of course, our topic today is coming out of the book of Romans. Uh, you can see we did the Gospel of John in the past. So if you want to study the whole Gospel of John, we got a whole category of those videos uh, that we have taken. You can study at your own time. If you want to catch up with us, if you're not at the same place in the Book of Romans that we are, you can go back on your own time and look up uh, the videos leading up to this point. So with that being said, tonight again, we're continuing in the Book of Romans. And we call this Romans part 14. Uh, we're going to be talking about Romans chapter 5 quiz that I forewarned everybody about. And we're going to talk about uh, being baptized, excuse me, being buried in baptism with Jesus as we go into Romans chapter number 6. Okay, so again, i got many categories for you to choose from. Just some of those that come to mind. I think it's 19 categories in all. you got some things with creation versus evolution. Um, if you're into that type of study... Uh, to really pretty much it's overcoming arguments with atheists. Okay, that's really what that really is about. Um, also, you have uh, the woman inspirations. You have books of the Bible like uh, Romans and the Gospel of John. You got marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You have sound doctrine, basically, which is the fundamentals of the Christian faith. You know, sometimes we as Christians, we come into the faith and we don't get the, those fundamentals. And so sound doctrine to help you come up. Uh, you know, and to be stronger in your knowledge of the fundamentals of Christian faith. And also we got societal issues. You know, we got things like abortion, all those type of hot topics are in there. In other words, I look at uh, the societal issues category as pretty much what's going on in the world, how a Christian should interpret these things and how we should respond to these things. OK. And one last uh, housekeeping thing, uh, administrative thing. Uh, we do have one more channel, but it's on TikTok. And you just go to TikTok.com and, and look up the word, one word, Bible Understanding. And that's our Bible Understanding Made Easy channel there, which is basically, again, the a ministry of the Henry Street Church of Christ. And again, you get one to three minutes of uh, uh, daily inspiration there. So if you want, don't want to use YouTube, you can use TikTok. Um, so whatever you're comfortable with, you can be inspired with the word of God accordingly. All right, let's go ahead and get into our quiz uh, this is going to be the interactive side of our lesson tonight. Um, we have a few questions that we'll go through. I'll give you a few minutes uh, to answer it. I'll be quiet for a while. And that's to give you a chance to type in your answer. And we'll discuss the answer shortly thereafter. Again, remember the quiz after each chapter is to make sure we understood the chapter correctly. Uh, we're able to maybe even articulate that it is to tell it to somebody else because the gospel shouldn't be hid but it should be uh, shouted from the rooftops from all of us, that is, that we're able to each one teach one uh, the word of God. All right, so let's go ahead. And again, remember our quiz is based on the chapter, but everything is fair game. What I mean by that is that uh, when we present the word of God, there's other scriptures that talk about the same uh, topic and give you extra details. So some of those things are not going to be off limit as well. So the first question here, is chapter five, question one. How is peace with God received today? We talked about this topic during our discussion of Romans five. Again, question one, how is peace with God received today? So I'll give you a couple minutes to type in your answers and I always have confidence in you 
uh, that you'll be able to get the right answer. So again, it's always open book. Open your Bibles, Romans 5, all, all those good things, and you'll find your answer. All right, so how is peace with God received today? All right, give you a couple minutes here. Please type in your answers. How is peace with God received today? It's one of the perks of being a child of God. It's one of the benefits of being a child of God. Go ahead and type in your answers. Okay. Christina Smith wrote, by faith. All right. Very good. Anyone want to elaborate on that further? Any other takers? How is peace with God received today? Someone wrote, uh, Sister Cheryl Coleman wrote, by reading the word and faith. Okay, that's an elaboration because the word is mentioned in her answer. All right, Christina also wrote, through Jesus Christ. All right, very good. Anyone else? Give you about a minute. This is Benita Thomas wrote, Peace with God is received through faith in God. All right, keep going. Very good. Uh, Justin Norwood wrote, Peace with God is received by having faith in Jesus Christ. No man can have salvation without Jesus being the head of their lives. Okay, good elaboration as well. Right, Brother James Johnson has said, by faith and justification. Justification being the forgiveness of God. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We've already talked about it, but it'll be as a hint to you, part of a question later on. All right, let's move on here just for time's sake. All right, so as mentioned, uh, gold star to whoever wrote this. I think several people wrote it. Uh, Peace with God only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We learn that from Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and verse number 10. Remember, Jesus is the great peacemaker uh, that took us from the stance of being enemies of God to those that are actually part of God's family from a spiritual standpoint because he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, wiping out our sins, which, of course, wipes out the division between uh, the faithful and God. OK, so Jesus, I like to call it Jesus is that bridge that brought us back to a peaceful, intimate, and loving fa family relationship with God the Father. So with this being said then, without this faith in Jesus, no man can have peace with God and by extension. This means that no man can have salvation without Jesus being the head of, our li of their lives. And of course, we know that from Acts chapter four, verse 12, but also John chapter 14, verse six says the same uh, thing. All right, so thank you also for the one that had put that in there in your answer. So this brings us to the, the topic of grace. God grace, remember it means the unmerited favor shined upon mankind. Remember unmerited means something we have not been, uh, have not earned, but have been given as a gift. So God's grace, which means unmerited favor shined upon mankind, is only accessible through faith in Jesus Christ. God will not give his favor unto any man outside of Christianity, contrary to popular belief. So this faith makes the Christian community rejoice. All of us rejoice as we will be glorified by God at the judgment day. So this means all Christians will have a home in heaven and eternal life. Again, John 3, verse 16, John 14, verse 1, and verse number 2, and verse number 6, all are reference points from the statements that are made. So very good. I pat you all on the back and say, good job on question number one. All right, so let's go to question number two. Now, this is the, one of the harder questions because this is something that uh, we as Christians don't want to go through, but it is part of the Christian reality. 
So question number two is, what is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? What is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes on here on this one. We have talked about it, and there's more than one answer to this question because the Bible does address it more than one time in the scriptures and attacks the issue from different angles. So again, what is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? Okay, I'll give you about two or three minutes here. Go ahead and type in your answer when you're ready, please. Again, this is based on our study of Romans 5 and any related scriptures on the topic. <clears throat> it's one of those life-changing questions that really helps you in your Christian journey when you get the answer deeply rooted in your heart. What is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? Question two. Any takers? another minute or so. Jocelyn Norwood wrote, suffering as a Christian makes us stronger. It also builds endurance with us, within us, excuse me, which allows us to remain in the faith. So we've got two things, stronger and endurance in our answer. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Anyone else want to build upon that statement or go a completely different thought pattern on this question? So again, chapter five, question two, what is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? Give you a little bit more time. All right, Christina Smith wrote, receiving the atonement, grace, joy. All right, very good. All right, Rita Woody, Sister Woody wrote, knowing that this earth is not your eternal home and that there is no pain in heaven. Absolutely. You're thinking about the afterlife. All right. So going even beyond this time, what is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? All right, so it sounds like there's actually benefits on this side of life as well as after we die, okay? From what you're all answering, combine your answers together. So again, chapter five, question two, what is the benefit of suffering as a Christian? Sister Benita Thomas wrote, if any man suffer as a Christian, we glorify God. So we give God the praise, the glory, the honor when we suffer. That's why I interpret what you're saying, Sister Thomas. All right, about 30 seconds here. And we'll move on just for time's sake. All right, Christina Smith wrote, no condemnation. All right, let's continue on. 20 seconds. Like your wheels are really turning. You're really thinking well here. And of course, even the answer I'm going to give you may not be comprehensive, meaning everything, but it's going to at least give us some encouragement uh, from the answer that we derived from our previous study. All right, let's move on. All right, so we're going back to Romans 5, verse 3 to verse number 5 as our answer, okay? So this is the value of the lesson he taught in Romans 5, 3 to verse 5, which obviously was from the inspiration of God. In other words, it came from God, um, Paul only being a conduit for the answer. OK, so Paul is telling us that we rejoice even when times are hard for us. And the result of this suffering is that it makes us stronger Christians, as was mentioned. In other words, it builds an endurance within us to remain in the faith. Romans 5 verse 3. Also, we see that patience, in other words, endurance, brings about experience. Now, remember, we looked up that word uh, experience in the original Greek language from which it was translated, dokime, and experience means to have tried character. In other words, it builds strong Christian morals within us. You know, I, I heard someone on a, I think it was a TikTok video, 
that uh, diamonds come from pressure. Okay, the pressures of life turn us from coal to diamonds. It makes us shine in God's eyes. It makes us a better person uh, is the way that God explains it to us from his word. And lastly, the Christian life produces hope. Remember, hope has no degree of doubt in it like we use the word today in the English language. Instead, hope is really a confidence, okay, without doubt. In other words, I like to say it, hope is an expectation of eternal salvation, okay, without any degree of doubt being there, okay? So, you know, in other words, you ex since God ex uh, tells us that eternal salvation is ours, we expect it, okay, because God cannot fail, okay? Thus, if we are faithful Christians until we die, then eternal life will be ours as promised by Jesus himself, Revelation 2, verse number 10. So remember the three things that come out of suffering, Okay, as a Christian, it builds endurance, number one. That is, it makes you stronger to stay in the faith. Because remember, your one time of suffering won't always be your last time of suffering. Something else will hit you, you know, before you die. And each situation makes you stronger for the next one. Okay, all right. Now, it also it brings experience, which we know in the original Greek language means tried character. It makes you stronger morally. OK, and lastly, it brings out the hope in you as well, because you know that um, eternal salvation is going to be yours. Like, for instance, if you've ever been delivered from anything in your life, any health issue, any financial issue, etc., you know that if God can do these little things on this side of life, and I'm not being sarcastic with that healing and finances, all that stuff, that's little stuff to God. OK. The big stuff is saving us eternally, okay? All right, because everything else on this side of life is going to perish at some point, but the soul lives on, right? And so if God can do all these things, they're basically signs of the power of God. We know he has also the power to give us heaven as our home in eternal salvation, okay? So that means that shows us why our hope, our expectation of what God can do and what God will do gets stronger when we go through things, okay? So again, thus, if we are faithful Christians until we die, then eternal life will be ours as promised by Jesus himself. Revelation 2 verse 10. All right, very good. Again, I pat you on the back and give you the gold star like our teachers used to do, uh, showing that you've done a good job on the question so far and question two specifically. All right, so let's go to question three. And I gave you a hint on this one that this word would come up. And remember the reason why I harp on these words is that you're going to see them in your Bible studies repeatedly. So you want to make sure that you're operating on the right definition of these things. So when you see them in other verses, you understand. Okay. So question three in chapter five is what does justification mean? And why is it important to Christians? Again, what does justification mean? And why is it important to Christians? And I'll give you a couple minutes, about two and a half minutes or so. And we'll go from there. Okay. All right, so go ahead and type in your answers again. You're doing very well. Up to question three here. What does justification mean and why is it important to Christians? All right, please type in your answers. All right, scholars, I know you're going to do well. Any takers, anyone will give it a try. All right, so Benita Thomas wrote, to be declared righteous by God. Very good. All right. Why is that important? Very good answer. <clears throat> the 
again, what does justification mean and why is it important to Christians? Our Justin Norwood also wrote, justification means to be declared righteous by God. All right, very good. So we got two concurring. All right, Christina Smith wrote, it means being forgiven and it's important because we are saved. All right. So what it sounds like, you can't be saved without justification. Pamela Norwood wrote, to be declared righteous by God because Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. Okay. All related topics to justification and salvation. All right. Give you about maybe 30 more seconds here. I think we can move on because I think you got this concept under your belt. In other words, I think you understand it pretty good. So we'll have to spend a lot of time here. About 10 more seconds, we'll move on. All right, Jocelyn Norwood wrote, this is important because man cannot earn this status. Okay, very good. All right, let's move on. Very good. All right, so this is related to Romans 5, verse number 9. Remember, God presented the word justified, and as you mentioned, it means to be declared righteous by God. And remember, this justification is only because of the grace of God. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and verse number, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and verse number 8. And again, this justification in God's eyes, we cannot earn it on our own. It is, it was done on the cross of Calvary. Okay, and we have this justification that is to be righteous in God's sight only because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Okay, that we have any possibility of looking holy in the sight of God. Okay. And when you understand this, that justification, just like grace, is a gift unto you that you and I did not earn. This drives us to more loyalty and obedience to God. Because again, justification has been freely given to all of God's people. Again, it's a gift. So uh, we, we, our allegiance, our commitment through faith and obedience um, is our thanksgiving for God justifying us when we don't deserve it when it comes to our own deeds, okay? If that makes sense to you, uh, type in I understand, okay? Remember, this blood of Jesus uh, results in us being justified. And it's important to be justified because as Christina has mentioned, it saves all faithful Christians from the wrath of God to be executed on the judgment day for those who will not believe and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Revelation 20 verse 11 to verse number 15 explains this. So remember putting all the scriptures together. First, you become justified. Then you become saved. Okay, because justification has to come before salvation. Um, how do I know this? Well, you look at Acts 2 verse 38. What did uh, God say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So after baptism, according to what God has taught in Acts 2, verse 38, comes remission, which means forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin is what? Being declared righteous in God's sight. And being declared righteous in God's sight also makes you what? Saved. Okay. So you see how the process works, okay? That's why I mentioned to you earlier in passing that you cannot have salvation without justification. You cannot have justification without forgiveness, okay? Because why? Forgiveness causes God to declare you as righteous, right? Okay? And you being forgiven and righteous cause you to be what? Saved in the sight of God, okay? So you can't have one without the other, okay? All right, so let's go on with that. I think you did it, uh, did that uh, very good. You understood it very well. Okay, let's go on. I uh, actually my quiz is taking a little bit longer than I thought, but that's okay because I think this is time well spent uh, because we're talking about what I call foundational 
um, aspects of the Christian faith. If we can't get these things right in our own minds, our whole theology, our whole understanding will be completely wrong. So this is the foundation that we're building upon. You know, symbolically speaking, we got to make sure we have these concepts right or our understanding will be completely wrong at the end of the day. All right. So chapter five, again, question number four. Again, this is more foundational stuff for the Christian faith. Uh, the question is, why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? Again, why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? There were many people that's been documented um, in history books, not the Bible specifically, but in history books uh, that didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. OK, a lot of people don't realize that you can't be saved if you don't believe he rose from the dead, literally rose from the dead. OK. All right. So that's not what I'm that's maybe that's part of the answer, but there's more to it. All right. So type in what you think. Why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? There's another reason I'm asking this question more than what I've told you so far. All right. So I'll give you about two minutes on this here. here. All right. So why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? I gave you one of the answers, but it's more to than than it's more than just what I said. All right. So chapter five, question four. Why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? All right, please type in your answers. I gave you one of the answers, but it's, it's several answers to this question, all equally important. Why is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? Anyone going to give it an attempt? All right, Christina wrote, we are now reconciled to God and saved from wrath. Okay, very good. Another minute. Anyone else? Pamela, oh, brother uh, James Johnson actually through Pamela Norwood wrote, so man can be saved by grace and mercy. All right, let's keep, keep it going. About 30 seconds. Okay, let's move on. That brings us down to Romans chapter 5, verse number 10, okay, is what this question is based on. All right, I think this was mentioned in another question we had earlier today, but we do see that the death of Jesus was the point of reconciliation between God and all who become Christians. As we mentioned a little bit earlier, we like use uh, the analogy of Jesus being a bridge between us and God the Father that brought about peace. That's what reconciliation means, remember? To bring two people that are at odds with each other back to peace, right? Okay. All right. So that his death did that. So this means that the death of Jesus Christ put out the anger of God against these blessed people and replaced it with fellowship and unity one with another. And even beyond this great unity with God comes another awesome blessing. That is because Jesus rose from the dead, 
He will also cause the Christian community to do the same thing on the judgment day. So that's one of the reasons why I was giving you earlier is it's important that Jesus rose from the dead because the, a dead man cannot do the things that he promised. OK, so he has to be living in order to uh, come back and take us back home to glory. First uh, Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, which he's going to do on the judgment day. Remember that he's going to come and you're going to find out that what those alive on earth are going to be caught up together with the dead that has risen with Christ in, in the clouds and be with him forevermore. So a dead savior cannot do that. Only a living Savior can do that. And a living Savior, Savior like Acts chapter 1 was uh, told to us, you know, when we studied it years ago, is that, remember, an angel was speaking to Jesus' disciples after the resurrection of Jesus. It said he's going to come the same way that he went. In other words, even though he went to the cloud, went, you know, up into the clouds, he's going to come back that same way. He's going to come back to the church and take it on to glory, the heavenly glory that's promised unto all of God's faithful people. OK, so that's why it's extremely important to believe and understand uh, the importance of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Only the living can do the things that are promised in the scriptures for all of us. So we know that he truly got out of the grave. So if you believe that type in, I know he rose. And again, when he comes back, uh, the risen Jesus we will enter the eternal joy of the Lord to live forever in the heavenly abode with Christ and the Father God. And some of this is uh, referenced in, of course, more scripture than this, but some good reference points for you is Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10, John chapter 14, verse 1 and verse number 2, Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4 uh, as well. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next question. Question number five, and it is this. How did God's grace come into the world? Again, how did God's grace come into the world? Now, we got to remember what grace means. I won't give you a hint this time because we talked about it a little bit earlier in our quiz. How did God's grace come into the world? I'll give you a couple minutes here on this one, okay? So go ahead and type in your answers accordingly, please. How did God's grace come into the world? You're doing a very, very good. Good job, everyone, thus far. How did God's grace come into the world? Give me a couple minutes, please. Go ahead and type in your answers. Don't be afraid because you're doing well thus far. This is Benita Thomas Rope. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Certainly. Anyone else want to build upon that or go a different direction in your answer? How did God's grace come into the world? Give you about another minute and a half or so. This is one of those celebration points for all faithful Christians. How did God's grace come into the world? Well, a little over 30 seconds. Some of you probably saying, I can't type that fast. Well, just do the best you can. That's all we can ask. <laughs> I know I type a lot faster on a computer keyboard than a touchpad on a phone for sure. All right, Christina Smith wrote by Jesus Christ and his gift. Anyone else want to build upon that? 
Reverend Mitchell, one of our elders at the Human Street Church of Christ, wrote it came through Jesus Christ. The scripture says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Very good. All right, about 10 seconds, we'll move on. Okay. All right, so let's go back in time, and that'll help us understand the times in which we live. All right? And Pamela Norwood also wrote, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our faith. All right. Going back to Romans 5, verse number 20, this is what this question is based upon. Remember, uh, Romans deals with uh, the superiority of faith in Christ over the law of Moses. And you're going to see that repeated quite a bit throughout the book of Romans. OK, remember, this did several things. It reminded that uh, the Jews that had not become Christians, that you need to become Christians to be saved. OK, you can't hold on to the law of Moses because the law of Moses cannot save you. The Old Testament, in other words. Uh, it also spoke to Christians that came from a Jewish background and what was it was doing, just like the book of Hebrews, preventing them from leaving Christianity to go back to the Judaism, Judaism um, religion, which is based on the law of Moses. OK, it also kept uh, arrogance out of the minds of Christians that came from a Jewish background that they were no better than um, Christians that didn't come from a Jewish background first. OK. You're also going to see, um, as you get deeper into the book of Romans, that God also addresses Christians that came from a non-Jewish background and made sure they didn't think that they're better than the Christians that came from a Jewish background. So he's going to basically, he's going to deal with all three groups of people uh, in the same letter that became the book of Romans. Okay, so remember, keep these things in mind. But let me get back on track here. Um, Romans 5, verse number 20, again, we're told that the law of Moses spread sin, okay? And remember, Paul is not saying that the law of Moses was evil. It was the word of God. There's no uh, if, ands, or buts about it. No doubt about that. Uh, but instead, though, what Paul is actually teaching us through the word of God is that when the law of Moses was put in place, it convicted everyone as sinners. In other words, there's not a person alive except Jesus, Hebrews 4, 14, and 16, that live in perfection under the law of Moses. In other words, all of us broke it. You know, every man has ever lived has broken the law of Moses. Again, just look at Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. We've all broken at least one of them, if not several of them or all of them at some point in our lives. And so with that being said, um, the law of Moses was basically calling for us to die instead of be saved. Okay. So these are the type of things and thoughts that Paul is putting on the minds of his audience then and now, okay, of the book of Romans. So the good part is, again, this is a celebration point, as I mentioned to you earlier. For Christians, God's grace is even more powerful. Um, it reverses the status of Christians from sinners to saints, uh, despite the fact that our deeds uh, and in and of themselves are not worthy to put us in the classification of saints. Remember, that's what grace is all about. Grace, again, is what? God's unmerited favor that's given to us as a gift. So it's, it is God's undeserved favor showered upon the unworthy, you and I, due to his tremendous love for us. John 3, verse 16, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to verse number 9. Remember, for those that um, have listened to my ministry for quite a while, you probably heard me make the statement that, you know, early on, maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, basically when I was going to school with Christina here, that's on the line at Western Michigan University, um, I really started making that change and turn to try to be a true Christian um, around the second semester of freshman year, you know, trying to really get my life right and change and um, just do the right thing in life, you know, just really being connected with God. It really kind of started my, my freshman year, you know, the real conversion part, part of my life uh, there. And, you know, one of the things I used to think about, you know, was, okay, Adam and Eve messed up in Genesis chapter number three. Why didn't God just destroy the world and start over? Well, 
for years, I could not answer that question until I really just thought about John 3, verse 16. And then the answer was right in front of my nose. It was right there. Because God, what did God say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Even though what I'm saying is man had rebelled uh, from him, God still loved us. So instead of getting rid of us, he wanted to save us and not only save us, but for us to live in eternity with him. OK, uh, even though we're as as um, the old hymn writer says, even though we're wretches, you know, he wanted to save a wretch uh, like us. OK, and that's only because of why his grace and his grace is only available through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John 1, 17. And without him being the head of one's life, I'm talking about Jesus, there is no grace, there is no forgiveness of sin, and there is no salvation. Romans 8, verse number 1, all is in vain without him, John 15, verse 5. Because remember, as many of you has answered, and we have talked about it uh, previously in this quiz, you know, that grace and truth came through Jesus. It didn't come through anybody else. It didn't come through Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. It didn't come through Moses. Uh, it didn't come through Muhammad for sure. I'm talking about Islam. The Bible said that what grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John chapter number one. So without uh, Jesus, there is no access period to God's grace. That's a hard thing for the world to understand, but the remnant, that small group of people, people that are going to be saved compared to those that are going to perish, um, that grace came only through Jesus Christ, okay? That's God's testimony. That's God's word. Who am I to challenge it? I cannot. You know, that's the creature trying to tell the creator what to do. I can't do that. And no man on earth can do that. Okay? No woman on earth can do that. It's God's blueprint, God's design. We can only build on what God has said. Okay? By his design, his design only. He designed salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Okay? All right, let's move on. And since time has run out, I'm not going to go as far as I want it to in the lesson tonight. But that's okay, because I believe you've done a good job. Again, I applaud you all for uh, going through the whole book of, uh, excuse me, the whole chapter of Romans chapter number five and doing a great job on the quiz. So again, you can't hear me applauding you, but I'm applauding you here in the background. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll just go through chapter number six's outline. That way you can prepare for uh, the next class and you can go ahead in your reading. But again, you always have Acts chapter number 17 and be like the ancient Bereans and study behind me, just like um, uh, they did with Paul. And God was pleased with that. So study uh, behind me for what you've already learned in Romans 5, uh, the quiz, etc. But also feel free to go ahead. And here I've break, broken down by the grace of God, uh, Romans chapter number six in four subdivisions in an outline. Um, part number one is that Paul teaches the necessity of obedience to God, despite grace being available to all Christians. Romans chapter six, verse one and verse number two. Section number two of chapter six is outline is Paul illustrates Christian water baptism as a submergence into death. It is unity with the death of Jesus, resulting in newness of life for the Christian. And in turn, this reborn child of God should walk in a way that demonstrates he or she is a reborn child of God. That's a mouthful, but that's basically a summation of what Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse number 4 is teaching. Again, division 2 of your chapter 6 outline. Uh, division 3 in chapter number 6 is that, again, where Paul is our subject. He teaches that sin should not reign over Christians as we are born again, causing us to obey God instead. Romans 6, verse 5 to verse number 14. A lot of people don't realize, but the book of Romans, um, though it, it uh, stresses faith a lot in Christ, it also stresses obedience to Christ a lot that people neglect. Okay. All right. In number four, the vision of chapter six of Romans we have where Paul warns against abusing grace, serving as righteous servants, and avoiding sinful ways, leading to death in order for us as Christians to receive eternal life. And that's the verses 15 to 23 again in Romans chapter number 6. So 
So again, if you learned something tonight, type in, I learned something. If you're grateful for something tonight from God has done, type in, I'm grateful. Uh, but remember these things. You always have an open invitation to um, fellowship and learn with us in this virtual broadcast of Bible study. Again, uh, we meet from se uh, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday nights. So not only um, should you come yourself, invite someone. Invite someone. Um, if they can't be physically present with you, they can always get online with us as well. Because uh, remember, not only uh, can you get on my site directly if you're my Facebook friend, but if you forward these videos during the live, they can get on with you, okay, and go directly to your site and get the same broadcast. Um, but also, uh, you should be able to get it on our specific page in Facebook for the Henry Street Church of Christ as well. But also, don't forget the open invitation to come out and worship with us personally. Uh, if you find yourself in the Northeast Alabama area or make a trip out there, uh, we'll make sure we roll out the red carpet, as we like to say symbolically, give you a warm Henry Street welcome and love and uh, worship together. And again, we meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. And again, uh, we can, uh, excuse me, you can reach more information about us quickly uh, via the internet at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Um, but don't forget the plan of salvation. That would make us even more grateful as it reinforces our faith, uh, knowing that we obey the Bible the right way and the only way. Uh, because God's plan of salvation is six steps. I always call it like a stairway to heaven. That is, uh, the first step is you have to hear the word of God. And that comes out of the book of Romans that we're studying tonight. Our, and this will be in chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The second step is in regards to our faith. Uh, we've quoted it several times. Let's do it one more time. We have to believe that Jesus is the son of God. Being the son of God means he is the central character of the Bible. Not only did he come from God uh, uh, himself as the offspring of God, but being the son of God also gives him authority and the ability to be called our Christ, which means our Savior. So in other words, it's a fancy way of saying he's the son of God, our Lord and Savior. And you see that in John chapter 3, verse number 16, uh, where the Bible says, for faith comes by, uh, excuse me, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The third step is also talked about uh, by Jesus himself in Luke 13, 3 and verse number 5. As a principle, he said that uh, we all must repent of our sins or we shall all likewise perish. Uh, Peter repeated the same thing in Acts 2, verse 38. And it's all over the Bible that we got to repent. That is, take on the life of living righteous as a Christian and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. In other words, keep your hypocrisy out of our spirits, okay? And you, again, you'll see that in Luke 13, 3 and 5, Acts 2, verse 38, just as two examples of the necessity of repentance for salvation. The fourth step in the plan of salvation is confession, that we literally have to, with our mouth, make that confession that Jesus is the Son of God, which means our Lord. You said in Romans 10, verse 9, verse number 10, Matthew 10, verse 32, and Acts 8, verse 37, just as three examples of the confession that we must make, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, to be saved with our mouth audibly, it must be done verbally, it must be done. I liken that to the traditional marriage ceremony here in the United States, uh, that before the preacher pronounces you husband and wife, for instance, uh, after you give your vows, uh, you must say, I do, that's your confession. Uh, that you want to be that person's husband or you want to be that person's wife, etc. Same thing with the plan of salvation. God tells us verbally that we must make our faith known. And you see an ex example of that in Acts 8 verse 37, where the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then you must go down in the water grave of baptism. That's the same thing as like, uh, uh, you know, making the marriage uh, official. That's probably the best way of saying it. Uh, because Jesus said in Mark 16, verse number 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So Jesus, the one literally that made it uh, absolutely necessary for us to be baptized for salvation. And remember what happens after baptism. Acts 2, verse 38 says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, remission is forgiveness of sin. So in other words, that's when forgiveness happens. Remember, we talked about that during our quiz. Uh, that's when justification kicks in. That's when it starts. And that's when salvation comes. That's why Jesus, again, said Mark 16, verse number 16, he that believes on the baptized and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So our Christian journey begins there. And after we come out of the watery grave of baptism, Jesus talks about us staying faithful. That is committed to our relationship with Christ. That's what faithful means, commitment to the relationship of being a Christian. So that means if you continue to believe and obey to the end in Jesus Christ, then heaven will be your home. Again, let me give you Jesus' words. The second part of Revelation 2, verse number 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Okay? All right, so again, quickly, uh, the plan of salvation is hear the word. Believe it concerning Jesus Christ as the Son of God, your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul, and living the Christian life until you die. That's being called, that's been called faithful unto death by the Lord Jesus himself in Revelation 2, verse Number 10. If you're a Christian, you're falling short. Sometimes you make some mistakes. Okay. Um, God says we can be restored uh, according to Acts 8, verse 22 and 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and verse number 10 by repentance, confession, and prayer. If we're a Christian, that have done wrong. God will take us back with open arms and forgive us accordingly. So again, love you all. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, as we used to say at my old job, I'll give you three minutes back as it's almost eight o'clock, but not quite. And hopefully we'll see you on the next time. Good Lord sees fit here Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time at Facebook Live or at the church building, 10 a.m. Central Time on Sunday mornings. God bless you. Love you all. Pray for us as we pray for you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.